So we like to finish off these shows with the mental health minute, as you've talked about yes. at the beginning. And yep. as our guest, you had a great one. And instead of me stealing the thunder, mm -hmm. like Gonky says, I always do. I would like you, sir, to <laughs> kick us off with the mental health minute. You just got to promise me Gonky is just going to say what he said, like he does to you all the time. Is that what's going to happen? He's going to say that. Um, like uh, that's right. <laughs> Unless it's a Mike Tyson quote, then he gets oh, very Oh, there uh, it is. Verbose. I don't quote yeah. him anymore. Yeah. So oh. I, I don't know how long I've got here. But, oh, dude, that was a good one. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. I'm going to need definitely some help after this now all that's in my head um so i'll tell this story um and, and i i told you guys because you asked me you know hey what, what would be a good topic and i said gratefulness and um i'll, I'll tell something that happened to me because we talk about all these good things right um great career great people great friends um wouldn't change anything that doesn't mean some really bad stuff didn't happen uh to me and um and i still wouldn't wouldn't trade these things and i'll kind of explain why in a minute but um when i turned 40 um i got the gift of getting sick uh, and not the kind of sick you get over quickly uh the bad kind of sick and um you know it, it came out of nowhere um i was a distance runner in great shape and you know really nothing going on and then the next thing you know um I'm down uh, hard and immediately lost my medical. Um, I was grounded in the Air Force and um, it happened so quick. You know, it was kind of makes your head spin because one week, you know, you're flying in and out of Dallas uh, at your airline. And then the next week you're out of the community. Um, and that's how quick it can happen sometimes, you know, when when things hit you. And so, and I was, you know, relatively young. I mean, 40 years old is, you know, just getting started in your career, uh, really. So um, the, the tough part was that the thing that I had, and I won't get into HIPAA things and all that stuff, but, but what I was, was down with, um, the first doctor that I met with, he said, you know, they, they tell us in medical school, this is the most pain the human body can experience. She said, it's worse than childbirth. And um, one thing I learned is if a doctor ever tells you that and you have kids, never repeat that to your wife. Um, I flight tested that and uh, she still does not believe me. Um, she's not a believer in that. So don't try. But um, I was really ill um, and in was in the worst pain I could ever imagine. And the docs were telling me you'll never fly again. Um, I remember being in one office and they said, you know, hey, this goes in your brain, you'll be paralyzed for life or it'll be terminal. And, you know, so these are the kinds of discussions that you're having and you're at 40 years old and huge chunk of your life ahead of you and little kids and, and all these things. And so this started like a three and a half year journey. So this was not a short process for me. Um, and for the first two years is when I was in this, this level of pain that is really hard to describe. Um, you know, I would go down like in the basement and just we had a finished basement. And I would like lay there in that carpet with my hands gripping and my face in the carpet, you know, just like trying to get through it, trying to breathe and those kinds of things. I mean, it was it was awful. Um, and you guys have talked about this before, too. You know, that one of the things with flying you got to be careful of is it can become your identity. You know, what you do becomes who you are. And some of that's OK because this is a profession, it's not a job. Um, you know, there's a level of professionalism that's required of it um, that doesn't exist everywhere else. And so it does become part of your life. You know, my kids know that most days of the week, I'm downstairs studying for probably 15 or 20 minutes every day at least um, to get ready. And I, um, so I, I'm dealing with this pain and I'm, losing everything job wise and i went to uh, my guard unit which required me to be on flight status and they had already told me hey you know unfortunately you can go for x amount of months and then you're going to have to go find another job and so i was going to lose my community there 
too. So, you know, you just start getting this stuff ripped away. And you guys have been through some of this, you know, so you know what that feels like. So it was interesting because I, you know, I had the science background um, all through school and, and I loved that research aspect. And so science always kind of speaks to me, uh, research and things like that, especially in psychology. That's what my degree was in. So I get up to my guard unit for this one weekend and they were having a uh, resiliency training. And there were probably 60 of us in the room and 59 of the people there, at least from what I could tell, were annoyed that they were there. And one person was like, I'll do anything. Like if there is anything I can get out of what they're about to teach me in here that would help me get through what I'm going through right now, um, I'll take it. I'll do anything. I mean, I was desperate. And uh, they had offered me all kinds of pain meds. And, and this was kind of during that time period when Oxy was out of control. And kind of five guys in my orbit had gone out with neck and back injuries and gone on Oxy. And all five of them were dead in 18 months. And so I was like, I will not take that medicine. Like, I don't know what's going on with it, but these guys were smarter than me, had more to live for in some ways. You know, I was like, I'm not doing that. And so I was just dealing with it. And um, so I go to this thing and they played this video about uh, these veterans that were dealing with severe anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, um, all the things after Afghanistan. And most of them were homebound. They couldn't even leave the house. Like it was that, that bad. So I'm watching this and they said uh, they were going to try an experiment with gratefulness. And I was kind of like, uh, okay, I mean, what's this going to do really? And they said, this program they were going to put them on would actually change the physical structure of their brain. And they were going to prove it with MRIs. And now I'm kind of leaning forward because I'm like, all right, now you're talking. I mean, this sounds like something that I could, you know, be interested in and understand. And so basically what they said, and it was so simple. They said every night before you go to bed, you're going to and you have to write it. You can't just say it. You can't type it in the computer. There's something about pen to paper that helps this. So you're going to write three things from that day that you're grateful for. And they can't be like, I'm grateful for my country or my faith or these large things. They have not that you can't be grateful for those. I mean, I am I'm like gonky. I'm a Christian. Um, and it got me through a lot of this. But it has to be little things like, you know, uh, my daughter told me a joke today that was just absolutely hilarious. Or I was out on a run tonight and I got to see this incredible full moon. And these are real ones that I, you know, I wrote down and you have to write these three things down every night. And within two weeks, you're going to see an incredible difference in your outlook on the world. And if you keep doing it, it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, this change in your outlook. So they followed these veterans who did this and they, they showed these studies and these folks went from being completely homebound to not just out in the world, but they had like joy again. And it wasn't that they weren't still missing their leg or didn't still have these kind of tremendous injuries and weren't in pain and all these other kinds of things, but they were grateful in the pain, not because of it, but they were grateful in it. So, and that changed their outlook and allowed them to go out and succeed. And when they talked to them after they had been doing this for a while, you know, you saw the first interview, the before and the after, and the difference was, it was unbelievable. So I went home and I'm like, look, this is not a medication. This is, I mean, this is like, you don't get any easier than write three things down a night and see if it makes a difference. And so I did. And I had a little book. I still have it. I still write stuff in it. Um, and I just started writing down three different things every single day. And it was so quick that my outlook changed and went from everything I lost that I was so focused on, you know, all the flying, how much pain I was in, all this kind of stuff. And that, you know, who knows what was going to happen to me because of my health or whatever. And I started picking up on all these little things that were a positive in my life every single day. And almost immediately I found I would wake up and start looking for my three things and I would pick, Oh, that's going to be what I'm going to write down tonight. 
And my brain, it was like a game. It was constantly looking for the good instead of focusing on what I had lost. Because look, we know the end of the story. I'm alive. I'm back to flying and all that. But back then, we didn't know how the story was going to end, right? So what I always tell people when I talk about this is um, I got grateful while I was still sick. I didn't get grateful because I got well. And that's the hard part. And once I was had that new outlook, I think it played a part in getting well, honestly. I mean, I think all that stuff can be related, but it got me out of that very dark spot that I was in for years. Um, and, you know, it it's a scary place to be when you have no hope and you have no idea what is going to happen in your life and you don't see a future out there um, that's very bright. And so that can happen to anybody. And I don't care what your rank is, your job is, like what, what you're doing. Every single person is going through something. And I will just say that that aspect of my outlook changing changed everything in my life. And then when I got well, I kept it. But again, I didn't get it because I got well. I got it first and then I got well. And I think I try to bring that, you know, kind of joy. It's not easy. It's a choice. You know, every day you get to pick. But um, writing those three things down, they make me every day still look for those three things. You know, you guys will be one of those for this being on this you know, until I get fired. Then maybe that'll be on the list. But um, the uh, all, all the free time I now have, I'm very <laughs> all the free right. time. You know, my brain is now suddenly <laughs> able to do all these other things. But um, I think too often people that get in like leadership roles or they get really successful in their career or whatever later in life, you know, they sort of give the impression it's like those Christmas cards we all get, you know, where everything's amazing and everyone won first prize and everyone did this and that and the other. And the year was incredible. I'm like, nobody's year is that incredible. <laughs> like, you know, so I read the Christmas cards. I'm like, yeah, I get it. You know, straight A's, you know, all these other things. But what really happened? Like what what really went on that year that you learned something from? <laughs> so I just share that to say uh, it was a simple thing that didn't require medicine. And it changed my outlook on the world. And just because you see somebody that's that's far along in their career, don't ever assume that um, they might not know what you're going through. And having gone through that has helped me in hundreds, if not thousands of conversations with people because of the empathy I have with them. And then I can talk to them. And I have, I mean, I, like I said, it, it's got to be hundreds, if not a thousand times in an office sat down and you find out what somebody's going through and, and they hear your story and it just helps. So Gonky. Yeah, that's <laughs> you covered a lot, sir. <laughs> I'm gonna have to agree with you completely about everything. So no, there you <laughs> go. Thanks, now, Mike. I mean, yeah. <laughs> now you hit a lot of good stuff. I mean, I, a couple of things I'll add. I mean, literally, the the battle is in your mind, right? Uh, and I've, I, I think probably all of us uh, are constantly looking for ways to get better. Uh, I've read a lot of self help books and. You know, it talks about just that. I mean, it's it's almost human nature to kind of focus on the things that we don't have. And, you know, one of the things I, I learned living in Asia, I I actually here in the States, especially, I think that's 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 a problem for a lot of people. Uh, there are, we're, we're a society, I think, that compares a lot, you know, the, the Joneses syndrome. And I think that that's a bad thing. Whereas when I live in Asia, people people were just happier, you know, even though they had less, but when you would talk to them, you could tell they were always talking about the things that brought them joy in life. And they were very simple things, you know, uh, and like when I went to Vietnam and stuff. So, um, I think some of that is a bit of a culture thing here in the West or at least in America. But, um, yeah, I, I, uh, when I find that I'm beating myself up, uh, it's usually almost always I'm focused on everything I don't have and it's pity party time. And, uh, I don't do it all the time, but when you shift gears, 
and start looking at the things that, holy cow, I actually, there's a, there's a lot of great things going on actually in my life right now. And it can, it can, it can really turn, turn things around in your mind quickly, sir. Just, just like you said, it does not take long. Um, I read that technique, uh, in a book somewhere about, you know, before you go to bed, writing the three things, uh, down that yep. you're, you're grateful for. I cannot remember the name of the book. <clears throat> and then, uh, like you said, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian and uh, it's crazy. Like a lot of these self-help techniques, uh, I, the smarter I get on the Bible, it's like, Hey, right there it is. Right. So, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic advice. It, there's no medicine involved. And it just takes uh, a choice, which is you just have to do it and try it. It doesn't cost anything. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know it works. Mover? Oh, yeah. Just here you go, Mover. Uh, well, what everybody else How's has just feel? said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, sir, so hearing your story, you know, I hear a lot of same stuff that, that I've talked about and, and been through myself, you know, I've had the medical thing where, you know, the exact same story where they're like, Hey dude, you, we're not talking about flying. We're talking about whether you're going to die. You know, that was with the aneurysm. Cause that's how my mom died. And, um, you know, going through that. And I think as you get older and as you progress, it doesn't get easier. It gets actually more difficult because you've got more experience and you start catastrophizing or whatever the word is about how bad things can get and you kind of spiral for me in 2020, you know, one into 2023, there was like this double like peak and Valley because, you know, I always talk about your mind is your most powerful weapon, but it can also be the most powerful weapon used against you. And for me that happened. And I went through some stuff flying related, directly flying related that I didn't, I, I want to be in an airplane. And that took about six months to get through. And that was tough. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And while I was doing that, though, it gave me the baseline to deal with stuff that would be much harder later because I went to military family uh, counseling, you know, the, the per person in the squad or non-medical counseling just to talk. And that was some of the things that she gave me. She's like, look, you need to go go walk barefoot on the beach, go ground yourself, go, you know, think of things that you're grateful for. It doesn't have to be bit. And at the time it was like, I'm grateful for my dogs. I'm grateful for the fact that they're still here, that they're alive, that they beat cancer, the stuff that was going on at the time. It's very easy to be grateful when things are going well, but it's very hard to find that when you feel uh, what I would later term, which scared some people because I said, I feel hopeless and helpless. Like at the yeah. lowest part, I felt hopeless and helpless. And they're like, you can't say that. And I'm like, well, that's where we're at right now. Because I felt that's like, real. I felt like the world was, you know, that like everybody had turned their guns on me, you know, and it was just a firing squad. So going through that, you have to lean on your, your, your inner circle, you know, your closest friends, you have to lean on, you know, your moral compass to get you through it. And then you have to, you know, you have to find a way to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And a lot of people will give you advice when you're going through something like that. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not so great. But for me, finding other purpose, like you talked about, um, because you'll make it your identity, especially when you're about to lose it or when you're in the process of losing something that you've spent your entire life creating. You know, you, you don't know how to deal with that because you don't have anything else. Well, luckily I did. You know, one of the things I did, which I just did this weekend, was uh, racing. So there's a group called battle scar motorsports. Uh, they do what's called adrenaline therapy for, for veterans, first responders and stuff. And it's, it's not about the racing, you know, everybody's like, well, are, you know, how'd you do? And it's like, they don't, it doesn't matter. You know, we're, we're not racing, you know, NASCAR, we're not racing IMSA. We're racing our own minds to try to have a team, to try to have a purpose and to go out there where, you know, like they talked about in the, um, uh, was a 20, the Le Mans movie, um, uh, the Ford movie where basically when you start, you know, hammering down on the track, nothing else matters. Everything just kind of fades away. And then you find that fellowship with your friends after, and you, you meet these veterans that have all been through something and they're all happy. They're all just happy to be there and happy that you're there and you get that. And then that was during the thick of it. And I, you know, okay, you're grateful there. And then you find the purpose I found with Luna, you know, just 
being able to help somebody else. And then once you transition from woe is me to how can I help somebody else, that's when it comes full circle because now you're like, look, yep. if I can't help myself, maybe I can help somebody else. And sometimes that's all you have to do. Like now I'm grateful for a lot of things. I find myself like, I'm grateful for Luna. I'm grateful for things going well. I'm grateful for, you know, the job I have uh, in the military. I'm grateful for all this stuff. But back then, very hard to find three things unless you forced yourself. So I think that's great advice. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, like we talked about before, there are so many good things, uh, in the military in general, you know, I know a lot of people in the military watch this, um, you know, DPH, uh, director of psychological health and a lot of wings, which I think is an amazing program. You know, I always try to send people, they come talk to me. I say, Hey, get this off your chest. Don't try to, to hold this, you know, internally because it'll eat you alive. Um, you know, military one source has non-medical counseling up to 12 sessions, it, chaplains are a great resource, your friends, and worst case, call 911. You know, don't make something that is temporary into a permanent solution. Um, so th there's always somebody out there that'll help you. But Doug, I hate to throw this on you, man, but <laughs> <laughs> so what do you got to wrap this up? You don't, you don't need me. You know, you've already got a, you've already got a guy with a psych degree and he covered it. So <laughs> that takes my role out of the, out of the galaxy far, far away. Right. Yeah. Um, it, th this is the second time on the show. Mace did it too, where somebody brought in something really cool that's simple, that's practicable. And my favorite part, it has research behind it. This is real. This is not some, some new age crystal. <laughs> this is, that's what we went after last time. This is real stuff. And um, I, my biggest task here is just to avoid geeking out about it for an hour and talking about the, you know, the actual things that happen in your brain that Sean mentioned. Um, one thing I really wanted to highlight, though, and Sean and Gonky both kind of referenced this, is it puts your behavior in front of your attitude, which is known to have a lot of power to make change. If you want to change an attitude, you change the behavior first, and that's effectively what this is doing. You know, you're focusing on good things that are true in your life and helping yourself remember them for the next time that you need them. And I think it was really important to to also highlight that Sean mentioned it worked before the physical state changed. This is something that worked while things were still wrong. Um, it's a big deal. Thanks for bringing it up, Sean. I actually didn't know about it. I was reading like crazy while you were talking. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> I don't know it's, if Mover mentioned pretty, that. I, Mover and I met when I, was, when I was his psychology professor. So this is right in my <laughs> wheelhouse. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. It's kind of, it always is amazing when, uh, something that's intangible causes a tangible physical structural change to me. Yep. That's, that's pretty impressive. It speaks to my faith, but it, it is an impressive thing. So yeah, enjoy. Uh, now I'm going to go back and read some more on it, but um, anyway, thanks for letting me share it. I appreciate it. No, that's awesome. And awesome. from, from the yeah. audience, I actually have a couple people chiming in as well. Kate says, I'm struck by your honesty about your life and motives and your gift for self analysis, Sean, sir. Uh, wow. <laughs> I, can we just end the show? <laughs> yeah. I've probably got uh, your fire text uh, when I hang up. So can I just yeah. have that one and just leave? Yeah. Midnightly says, if you can train, uh, you can train your brain to focus on the positive things and turn your focus away from the negative, i.e. I can't even say that word. Grief catastrophizing. There you go. Me, That's it. Yeah. yeah. Whatever, man. That, that comment literally came up while I was writing the same thing in my notes while Sean was talking. I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Aaron says the best mental health minute ever. I needed to hear this. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Thanks, and Aaron. then John says being grateful makes sense of our past, brings peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. He says it's Melanie, uh, Beatty, but I think it's probably Mike Tyson. I, uh, wow. <laughs> I saw it coming, dude. I knew it was coming. I knew it was uh, coming. <laughs> oh, he telegraphed man. that jab. I'm surprised uh, he didn't put in there just Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why he didn't. That's, confused me when it said anything quote. other than Mike Tyson. Yeah.